working. So that's like a, a general trend. And if there's any decrease in more than 10%, again, you see that the patients are probably deteriorating. Also, um, you get CMP, your metabolic profile, uh, your creatinine kinase, CRPs, and ferritins can all be drawn on a daily basis to check how the patient is doing. Apart from that, I'd also want you uh, guys to uh, uh, focus on uh, the, the levels of PT, PTT, and D-dimer. Um, well, again, a PT, PTT, and D-dimer need not be measured every day, but uh, in the setting of an ICU or if uh, on baseline, if they're elevated, you'd want to, again, have them checked um, almost every, uh, every day or every other day based on the severity. Um, then the, we have uh, other labs like LDH, proponent, and EKG or ECG, uh, especially if you're starting a QT prolonging agent, you'd want to have a baseline ECG to see how the uh, agent is going to affect the patient's QT interval. Uh, we'll talk about more QT prolonging agents later on in our uh, course of uh, our discussion. Right. The patient should also undergo a hepatitis B serology and antibodies for hepatitis C and HIV testing. Now, um, the reason behind getting a hepatitis panel um, is for the, uh, for the basic uh, differentiation of whether the patient's elevations in the transaminase levels or the course of the disease is actually due to COVID-19 or is it also uh, to contribute to some of the underlying uh, liver pathology undergoing in this patient. So that kind of gives you an uh, overview of what you're looking at when, when you look at the ASTs and ALTs and TVLs every day. So apart from that, um, the chest x-rays and CD, there's been a lot of controversy about uh, how often the chest x-rays and, uh, and chest CDs need to be drawn. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, there was a new article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which states that chest x-rays need not necessarily have to uh, be taken every single day in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. So does CD scans of the chest. I'll tell you why, because it's not really going to change management per se. Uh, so there's no point in taking chest x-rays or CD scans of the chest uh, on a daily basis, uh, unless, again, if you're suspecting there's, there can be a secondary bacterial pneumonia superimposing onto the COVID-19 pneumonia, that's when you would want to get a chest x-ray. We'll, we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Again, the uh, possibility of a secondary bacterial infection uh, so far has been very low. Um, in patients with COVID-19, and we do not really expect um, uh, a secondary bacterial pneumonia in such patients. But nevertheless, uh, our clinical judgment should come into place when uh, dealing with COVID-19 and the suspicion with secondary bacterial pneumonia. Uh, with regards to the ECGs, and most of these patients um, who have severe illness also have underlying uh, uh, heart diseases, and a baseline ECG is needed. Um, again, uh, if the troponins are shooting up uh, and there's, there are clinical features suggestive of cardiomyopathy, then you might, you might want to get more ECGs or echo and subsequently the management as per uh, what the patient's symptoms are and what the preliminary diagnoses are. Now, uh, now that we've spoken a little bit about the diagnostic uh, part, now let's talk more about the intervention part. And uh, I'd want to talk about the intervention in terms of the general management issues, like say the patient has come into the hospital, now what do you want to do? What, how, how are you going to take care? And then we'll talk about the specific COVID-19 therapies. And finally, I'll talk about the discharge and, and my uh, presentation. Now, there's been a lot of buzz about empiric treatment for bacterial pneumonia in select patients, uh, in patients who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Well, it's not necessarily uh, treated. Um, for, first, first of all, the reason being that not a lot of patients with COVID-19 also have a secondary bacterial pneumonia. A high index of suspicion based on clinical grounds should direct therapy for a secondary bacterial pneumonia, like if there's a chest x-ray showing some low bar consolidation instead of the diffuse ground glass opacities as seen 
um, on, uh, on the chest x-rays of COVID-19, like Dr. Khadr Vali's first initial couple of slides showed um, how there was more diffuse uh, involvement of the lungs in bilateral. Um, and um, on the contrary, if you're having more low bar con consolidation of one particular lobe in one lung, um, then again, think in lines of secondary bacterial pneumonia. Same goes with any new fever with defervescence and the new productive cough uh, or increase in cough of that is already existing and any features that raise concern should be treated for bacterial pneumonia. So the, the literature says that uh, such patients should get sputum and blood cultures, at least two sputum and two blood cultures. And um, once you've confirmed that there's no growth on the sputum or blood cultures, the antibiotics should be stopped because they're not going to be much beneficial and just adding up to a lot of drug interactions. So uh, it's as much as possible if you're not uh, sure about the diagnosis, just discontinue the antibiotics. Now, a low procalcitonin can be helpful to rule out bacterial pneumonia. You all know that procalcitonin is a marker for bacterial infection. But high level cannot really rule in as high levels of procalcitonin can also be seen in COVID-19. So you cannot really differentiate if the patient has uh, bacterial pneumonia over COVID-19. Now, having said that, uh, the other general management issue would be the prevention of and evaluation of venous thromboembolism. So we at our hospital in St. Joseph here, uh, we provide pharmacologic doses of uh, venous thromboembolism in uh, all patients who are hospitalized, irrespective, uh, even if it's COVID-19 or non-COVID-19. And we give them either Lovenox of 40 milligrams of Q or Aliquis of 2.5 milligrams per oral BID or a Zaralto based on the renal profile. Well, there's been a lot of talk, especially around the time of April and May, about the un uncertainty about usage of NSAIDs. Uh, well, there's not really a great evidence, though, that NSAIDs should not be used. But again, consider uh, the risk versus benefit ratio and treat the patients accordingly if they need NSAIDs. But however, if, you're, uh, if you want to use an NSAID for a fever reduction, acetaminophen works equally as good if not better uh, for fevers in patients with COVID-19. Uh, another important thing that I'd like, you, uh, I'd like to draw atten your attention to is to avoid nebulizing medications. So inhalational medications delivered via nebulizers tend to cause aerosolization of uh, uh, particles. And uh, in the earlier presentation by Dr. Khadavali, how he was telling me um, and us all that uh, particles less than five micrometers tend to travel a lot larger distances, especially more than one meter. And if you're in a room um, dealing with a COVID-19 patient, patient and then uh, he, uh, he's uh, being nebulized with a medication, then there's a greater propensity for uh, easier spread because of the aerosolization of the SARS-CoV-2. So no nebulizers, please. Um, on the flip side, if the patient has severe asthma, what are you going to do? So it's better to use meter dose inhalers because it's more uh, in a closed environment uh, more than open uh, environment. Now, how do you manage it in chronic medical conditions? Initially, there was a, a lot of controversy with regards to the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs that they might potentiate uh, the COVID-19 pneumonia. But uh, there's not been any substantial evidence to prove that. And ACE inhibitors and ARBs can safely be used in patients with COVID-19. There have been a lot of research, a lot of journals uh, uh, showing the same evidence that no matter what, no matter how severe the disease is, ACE inhibitors and ARBs can always be continued depending upon what the patient's requirements are. Statins. So um, most of the patients with severe COVID-19 also have, like I said, a lot of underlying uh, comorbidities, especially cardiac uh, comorbidities. So you don't want to stop these patients on statins. Um, and some degree of confusion may also arise uh, with transaminous elevations, uh, especially seen in COVID-19. But then again, statins are not so notorious to cause liver injury. So it's fine uh, that you can uh, go on to continue statins. Um, there's an increased risk of severe disease with other respiratory viruses um, with worse outcomes. Um, so a decision to whether or not 
prednisone, biologics, or other immunosuppressants should be stopped or not should be made on a case-to-case -case, uh, basis, depending upon the severity of the other disease other than COVID-19. Now that we have discussed a little bit about the general management issues, now let's focus uh, and uh, draw our attentions more uh, vividly towards uh, COVID-19 specific therapies. Now, before I get started by, uh, to talk uh, about COVID-19 specific therapy, um, I'd like to uh, give you a um, sort of a, a terms and conditions tag uh, saying that um, most of the studies that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides um, are not over yet. They are in the process of a study and in the interest of uh, public uh, health, uh, maintenance, and safety. Some pilot projects, some preliminary data have been extracted and guidelines are sort of being formulated based on these preliminary reports. So any of the um, specific therapy that I'm going to talk about, is it proven? No, it's not proven. But do we use it? Yes, based on the current recommendations and guidelines, we do want to use it in the interest of a, a larger health benefit to the patients. So I want to talk about the most buzzing treatment specific COVID therapy, at least over the past one month, um, dexamethasone. There's been a large randomized controlled trial which suggests low dose six milligrams dexamethasone for severely ill patients requiring supplemental oxygen or ventilatory support. So these are severely ill patients Again, those with hypoxia or requiring oxygen, right? Severe patients. And they should be requiring supplemental oxygen or ventilatory support. So these are the patients that have the largest benefit with the use of dexamethasone, six milligrams. Uh, the therapy is usually for 10 days or until discharge, whichever is shorter. And the equivalent doses of other glucocorticoids like methylprednisolone, 32 milligrams, or prednisone, 40 milligrams, can also be initiated uh, in, the, in the event of non-availability of dexamethasone. If there's shortage of dexamethasone, you can go ahead and use these medications. Now, with the use of glucocorticoids, there's always a high risk of infection with bacterial and fungal agents, something that you always need to keep at the back of your mind when you're treating your patients with glucocorticoids. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to this recovery collaborative group, uh, a study that was performed uh, performed and is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, a preliminary report shows a 28-day mortality benefit, especially among hospitalized patients treated with dexamethasone. There's also been um, uh, the, this uh, dexamethasone uh, tried on patients with invasive mechanical ventilation or uh, patients on ECMO, the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and at baseline, it showed about 36% relative reduction in mortality and the age-adjusted analysis of about 12.3%. Um, the same goes with patients with non-invasive oxygen therapy at baseline showed 18% relative reduction in mortality with an age-adjusted analysis suggesting about 4.1% absolute mortality, mortality reduction. So overall, uh, cutting out all the epidemiological jargon in simple terms for our medical students right here, I want to tell that patients who are on invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO who were given dexamethasone low dose for 10 days showed about a 36% decrease in their mortality, which is significant in terms of the numbers that we calculated epidemiologically. There has been also some benefit on non-invasive oxygen therapy, but the people with, uh, who required uh, oxygen therapy had greater benefit is what I'm trying to make my point here. Um, in contrast, there is no benefit uh, among individuals who did not require oxygen therapy or ventilatory support uh, at baseline. So these are the patients who are our moderate category, right? Uh, who did not require oxygen, but then who are hypoxic a little bit, or dyspneic rather, I should say. So these are the, those patients. They did not really have a lot of benefit from this trial, okay? Okay, by far, this is the only study and the only drug that has been uh, given some sort of assurance that it can reduce mortality. Nevertheless, like I said, this study has not been completed, and there are a lot of questions with, regarding to the, uh, with regards to the 
validity of the study in itself and uh, the various uh, other confounders that can potentially have skewed the results. So we're have, we'll have to wait uh, further on to see how the study goes on and if the dexamethasone can stand to its point. Yes, we'll talk about remdesivir now. Remdesivir is a nucleotide analog that has activity against uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in vitro. That is, in your lab, you have SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then you're adding remdesivir. Definitely, it's going to stop it. But in vivo, what's what's really going on? Let's let's take a look. Now, if available, remdesivir should be used for hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, particularly to those requiring low flow oxygen, supplemental oxygen. Now I'd want to draw your attention towards this key word called low flow supplemental oxygen. We were talking about high flow oxygen and mechanical ventilation, ECMO, and all of those big stuff um, for dexamethasone. But on the contrast, we're talking about low flow supplemental oxygen for remdesivir. So it has shown significant benefit uh, in patients requiring low flow supplemental oxygen. So the protocol that we follow at our hospital is giving remdesivir 200 milligrams as a loading dose IV given on day one, followed by 100 milligrams once daily for the next five days. It can be extended to 10 days if there is no clinical improvement and in patients on mechanical ventilation or ECMO, although um, we do not know for sure it, 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 that how remdesivir can be beneficial, especially in patients on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. But then again, we'd want to give in good faith that remdesivir uh, will probably help patients who are on advanced ventilator, ventilatory supports. Patients who improve early do not need to complete the course and they can be stopped prematurely, all right? And it should not be started in patients with and alanine transaminase uh, levels more than five times the upper limit of normal or in those patients whose levels rise beyond this level on therapy with remdesivir. So that's something that you need to keep in mind. You need to keep checking the CMPs every single day if your patient is on remdesivir to see if uh, his transaminase levels are shooting up. It should not be used in patients with an estimated GFR of less than 30, that is, clinically CKD4 and beyond, unless the potential benefits outweigh risks. And it should not be used along with hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine due to potential drug interaction. We'll talk about hydroxychloroquine in just a bit. Now here are a bunch of other trials which essentially said that remdesivir um, was superior to placebo in shortening the time to recovery in adults hospitalized with COVID-19 and the evidence of lower respiratory tract infection. And another study uh, that was also uh, published in Lancet, uh, it said that remdesivir was not associated with statistically significant clinical benefits. However, the numerical reduction in time to clinical improvement in those treated earlier requires confirmation in larger studies. So although it was not proven in terms of the numbers, how much beneficial it is, but then uh, on clinical grounds, definitely patients tended to get better on remdesivir. So that was the whole gist of the study. So uh, it also showed a 14 day mortality benefit among patients on low flow oxygen requirements, something that I've been stressing upon uh, over the past couple of slides now. So reported side effects, here are, the, here are the list of some of the side effects that these patients had. Nausea, vomiting, transaminase, elevations, um, and some uh, more co most common uh, adverse events were anemia, acute kidney injury, fever, hyperglycemia, and elevations in transaminases. Yes, we'll talk about convalescent plasma, uh, another treatment modality in the United States. Um, uh, convalescent plasma was started as a, uh, in, it, it was started in good faith that this probably might help without actually knowing whether or not the convalescent plasma um, can be beneficial, because uh, usually the way it works is, uh, usually a drug is uh, going into clinical trial phase one, phase two, phase three, and then finally into the market. 
but convalescent plasma was prematurely authorized by the FDA to get started in various hospitals because uh, the risk versus benefits um, was pretty less and the benefits outweighed the risk. So convalescent plasma was approved by the FDA to be used in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And convalescent plasma proves clinical benefit when given early in the course of the disease and not who in and not in those patients who require mechanical ventilation. Although convalescent plasma improved the rate of nasopharyngeal viral RNA clearance within 72 hours compared to standard treatment alone, there was no statistically significant differences in the overall rates of clinical improvement. It's the same case like that of Remdesivir we were talking about. So it did show that the RNA clearance was pretty quick and patients came out negative after convalescent plasma infusions uh, through their nasal swabs, but clinically they tended to improve slower than what was expected of them. That's the whole gist of the convalescent plasma. So in a nutshell, I would say convalescent plasma is beneficial if the patients are very early in their course of their disease and not very serious. So those are the patients who can be given convalescent plasma for some clinical benefit. Now, uh, these are the three most important um, uh, specific COVID-19 therapies, which are creating a lot of buzz across um, several societies, especially the Infectious Disease Society of North America, uh, or say uh, the, uh, the Thoracic Society of uh, America. So uh, apart from these, we have several other treatment modalities which are under clinical trials. None of them have been proven to be absolutely beneficial. Some of the trials say, um, well, there is benefit. Some of the trials, again, they say, oh, we have uh, segregated and did uh, subsection analysis, and now they're not so beneficial. Uh, well, I'll walk you through some of these uh, medications that are uh, into the market, some, some of these medications which are in the process of being approved by the FDA. Uh, none of this have been proven to be absolutely beneficial, but I'll give you a gist of what's really going on. I'll quickly walk you over through, through, through all of these medications. The interleukin-6 pathway inhibitors. So markedly elevated inflammatory markers and elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines are associated with critical and fatal COVID-19 and blocking the inflammatory pathway has been hypothesized to prevent disease progression. So keeping this in mind, the use of tocilizumab and sarilumab in the direct interleukin-6 inhibitor, siltuximab, was started. However, uh, the results of some of these trials did not really indicate a clear benefit, clinical benefit from these agents. Also, it was also increased with uh, risk of secondary infections. And so uh, the use of, the common use of these uh, uh, inhibitors, uh, interleukin-6 inhibitors has been um, not encouraged by the FDA unless if there's a clinical trial going on. So in general hospitals, we're not giving interleukin-6 inhibitors. Now there are more risks than benefits and uh, should be avoided, especially in patients who are in hospital with COVID-19 uh, for chloroquine. Um, they may have some activity in vitro, but in vivo experiments lack significant benefit. And there have been multiple studies that have shown that hydroxychloroquine has not been proven to be even uh, beneficial, not for mortality, not for clinical improvement, not for length of hospital stay. So in all three domains, it has failed. And also, on top of it, there's an increased risk of patients dying or getting intubated um, when treated with hydroxychloroquine uh, because of the prolonged QTC intervals and the propensity of patients slipping into arrhythmias, several of various types of arrhythmias. Some of the other options is, uh, are favipiravir. Uh, favipiravir was associated with fast rates of viral clearance like that of convalescent plasma, but and it also showed more frequent radiographic improvement uh, in comparison with uh, patients treated with lopinavir and ritonavir. We're going to talk about these protease inhibitors in just about a bit. And um, like we were talking about interleukin six inhibitors, the same uh, the same knowledge was applied here as well, and they thought uh, patients can be given interferon beta. 
because um, it had shown some activity in vitro against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there was a very popular trial that was going on in Hong Kong, and they were giving something called as the Hong Kong cocktail. The Hong Kong cocktail can, consisted of subcutaneous interferon beta along with oral ribavirin and lopinavir, ritonavir, if the symptom onset was within seven days, or the patients were given ribavirin along with lopinavir, ritonavir, if the symptom onset was between seven days to 14 days versus uh, there was a control with lopinavir, ritonavir alone. And they found that patients in the intervention group, that is those treated with either interferon beta or with other than uh, the other than just the lopinavir, ritonavir, that, that is your ribavirin, um, had more rapid times to a negative uh, RT-PCR test on nasopharyngeal swab and also showed clinical improvement in hospital discharge. So it does have some benefit, but again, it has not been approved for general use in uh, most of the hospitals, except for those hospitals which are uh, under clinical trials. And following this pathway, uh, there are several other immunomodulatory agents of various classes, including anakindra, which is your interleukin-1 inhibitor, and then we have cytokine inhibitors, kinase inhibitors, complement inhibitors are all being evaluated if they have any role um, in treating patients with COVID-19, but none of them are, again, uh, approved by the FDA to be used. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the most commonly used uh, medications, azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. I want to spend some time on these two medications. So most of these studies have, have not demonstrated any clinical benefit in the use of azithromycin in combination with hydroxychloroquine. Both of these medications are associated with long, prolonged QD interval and their combined use may only potentiate the further adverse effects and uh, might have more uh, ICU uh, evaluations and more uh, intubations, especially when given to patients with underlying COVID-19 disease. Some other agents, ivermectin was uh, shown to have some in vitro activity like many other drugs that we just discussed and uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. So they've all been used and there are, continue, uh, are, are currently being evaluated if they can be used or not uh, in the general public. Now, having spoken about uh, these specific COVID-19 therapies, I'd like to draw your attention towards how you want to approach towards patients and how to treat such patients with uh, confirmed COVID-19. Right. So far, I've given you a brief gist of how patients with mild disease can only be symptomatically managed outpatient, moderately should be hospitalized, severely ill patients need to be hospitalized as well and treated accordingly, right? Now, the trial data, it suggests that a, there is a, a huge clinical benefit with remdesivir and a mortality benefit with dexamethasone, but no other therapies have been clinically proven beneficial. The Infectious Disease Society of North America uh, provides recommendations on therapies with hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin, uh, tocilizumab, or lopinavir, ritonavir not to be used in, uh, in inpatient or outpatients on a common basis. This was only potentiated by the National Institute of Health. Uh, who also said that these, these agents should not be used unless it's out of, uh, unless it is in the context of a clinical um, trial. So some of the take home points for you all today would be supportive care only for patients with mild disease, um, close monitoring for clinical worsening if these patients with mild disease also show some other symptoms which you think are um, to be kept an eye on. If they do develop features of severe disease, they should be treated. And some of the patients with non-severe disease have lab abnormalities that are associated with the progression to severe disease. And if possible, treat them with uh, agents uh, similar to those having severe disease but not requiring oxygen. And uh, they'd also uh, likely not be eligible to receive remdesivir because they're not requiring any oxygen. 
Now, how to manage patients with severe disease? Now, I want to categorize this category of severe disease further. So I would want to subdivide this into patients uh, requiring oxygen, not requiring oxygen, requiring ventilatory support. Patients with severe disease, that is patients with hypoxia, but without oxygen requirement, that is patients only on low dose oxygen requirement should be treated with remdesivir. Remdesivir should be prioritized for patients on low flow oxygen supplementation and dexamethasone uh, in such patients is not really suggested. Now, how about patients with severe disease who are receiving supplemental oxygen? Now, it depends upon whether these patients are on high flow oxygen or having in non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation. The patients on high flow oxygen and non-invasive ventilation like your BiPAP, CPAP, and lower than invasive, uh, invasive vent ventilation, these patients should receive low-dose dexamethasone. The trial data has time and again proved that dexamethasone improves mortality in these patients who are not on non-invasive oxygen, oh, sorry, who are on non-invasive oxygen supplementation. Now, patients with severe disease who require mechanical ventilation or ECMO, your extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, for such patients, low-dose dexamethasone is recommended, uh, but we do not know how much of it uh, really improves mortality. Uh, we've, uh, we've only known that it, it does show some mortality benefit, but not as much as in those patients who do not require uh, invasive vent ventilation. Because the clinical benefit of remdesivir is less certain for this population, the use of remdesivir is suggested only in patients who have been intubated or uh, for a short period of time, um, this remdesivir. Now, um, having read the remdesivir and dexamethasone, there are not really a lot of drug interactions in terms of their pharmacokinetics or dynamics when they're going together within the patient's body. So um, th there should not be a second thought to have both medications running side by side in a patient. So go ahead and dose your patients with remdesivir and dexamethasone and do not think of any drug interactions. Now, a decision to discharge now, um, since there's a lot of confusion about, okay, this patient is COVID-19 positive, how am I going to discharge this patient, is going to spread other people? Well, there's been a lot of uh, confusion whether or not uh, this patient should be discharged, but if you want to keep the patient in the hospital, for how long, right? So that's a question, uh, the discharge disposition has been a question of a huge controversy over the past, over at least three, four months, but now we have come to a consensual um, agreement that a decision to discharge a patient with COVID-19 is generally the same as that for any other condition that the patient comes into the hospital. Um, these patients need continued need for uh, infection control precautions and should not prevent their discharge to home just because they have infection control precautions. Um, outpatient follow-up can uh, happen through either telehealth, something that is being rampant uh, over the past seven, eight months now. Um, so uh, organize a telehealth follow-up visit or maybe an inpatient visit if you want to examine the patient yourself. So patients who have recovered from COVID-19 should be encouraged to consider donating co convalescent plasma as well. So this is a chart that we follow at our hospital at St. Joseph. Um, so all patients uh, who are discharging, we need to address their anti anticoagulation status. So if the patients have had chronic anticoagulation, say a patient uh, had a previous history of AFib, has been on a Pixaban for forever. Okay, so just continue their medications uh, prior to discharge. Now, if there's someone who's got a recent DVT or maybe a pulmonary embolism or any other uh, venous thromboembolism during the course of the hospitalization, then such patients should be treated therapeutically with anticoagulation with, uh, for three months with uh, either of these three medications, uh, your low molecular low heparin or the direct oral anticoagulants or the, the warfarin that you commonly use, okay? And if none of these uh, conditions are present and there's no specific, no other specific diagnosis for long-term anticoagulation, 
uh, anticoagulation should be based on whether the patients fall under low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. Patients with a D-dimer less than two times the upper limit of normal on discharge, these patients are low risk, you don't have to start any anticoagulation. But if their D-dimers are more than two times the upper limit of normal without any risk factors, Consider starting them on low-dose aspirin. Uh, here it's written 81 milligrams. I know in India we have 75 milligrams per oral aspirin. Uh, and advise the patient to stay active at home and monitor. Okay, And patients who are, are falling under the high-risk category, which uh, are patients with D-dimers, more than two times the upper limit of normal on discharge, plus underlying comorbidities, uh, or if you see that this patient has had a recent surgery with uh, a requirement of prolonged immobility um, or a prior VD history or hormone use or any other risk factors, again, go ahead and bump up these patients with low molecular weight heparin or your apixabans or um, warfarin. Now, finally concluding, um, I'd want to discuss this special situation with COVID-19. I, 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 I hope I'm not taking a lot of time here. Um, just another slide. So uh, people with HIV, many, many of the comorbid conditions associated with co severe COVID-19, like cardiovascular disease uh, uh, risk factors, uh, frequently occur in patients with HIV and COVID-19. And in these patients, in addition to the CD4 cell count, uh, additional risk stratification based on the general condition of the patient, uh, his CD count, the CD4, the CD4 cell counts, and other comorbid conditions should be made and treated accordingly. The management of COVID-19 in patients with HIV should not differ. It should be the same as in patients without HIV, although there's been a lot of buzz about usage of lopinavir, ritonavir uh, for COVID-19. Nothing should be changed as far as lopinavir or tonavir combination is concerned for HIV medications. They should be used as, uh, as prescribed for HIV uh, and no modifications should be done for those patients. Some of the patients are also prescribed PrEP therapy, the pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, it's popular here by the name Descovi. Um, it's tenofovir plus amtricitabine. Uh, and it has been associated with a lower rate of COVID-19 diagnosis and a lower COVID-19 associated mortality rate compared with other nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor backbones. So these are my extensive uh, list of references. I'd like to thank uh, each one of you from the bottom of my heart for having listened to me patient patiently. If you have any other questions, you can always shoot um, the questions to my email or you can drop in any uh. questions here. I don't see it right here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to, I'd like to take this opportunity to profusely thank the management of uh, AIMSR, the students, the faculty, and my beloved professor, Dr. Khader Wali, for having invited me, having me over. Uh, I know it's been a, it's been a, a long session. Uh, I'd not, uh, I'll not take much more time. Uh, finally, I'd like to say uh, happy Independence Day in advance, and I hope you all stay safe, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Rasik. Uh, any questions from students side or from faculty sides? Any yeah, questions? Uh, Dr. Rashid, I'm Dr. Sivachandra Raj, Professor of Pharmacology. So uh, actually, there was recently the FDA has given approval for uh, aviptadil, the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide through inhalation route. So, and other thing about you, uh, you said that New England, uh, this uh, remdesivir, the, uh, become popular only after publishing in New, New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet. Those two uh, articles were retreated because the wrong data was uh, over provided by some fraud scientists, three uh, scientists. Then the, these uh, published articles were retreated. Basically, these two articles that downgraded the hydroxychloroquine, saying that it is too toxic and ineffective, but it is not so. It is actually, it appears, it is quite effective and it is not uh, that much toxic. So, what is your uh, comment well, on this, Dr. Rasik? 
Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for engaging me in this wonderful discussion that I've been having with my colleagues uh, here at the hospital as well. We've had uh, extensive discussions, especially on this particular topic of, of whether remdesivir is more beneficial or hydroxychloroquine. I agree with you. Uh, there, there's been a couple of the articles that were withdrawn from Lancet, not any jam though. Uh, Lancet, uh, it did uh, withdraw one, one article, actually a couple of articles, after uh, there was some fraudulent uh, mischief by one of uh, our uh, scientific community. But then again, uh, having looked at the larger picture, uh, there have been uh, other trials uh, that are happening, especially the, the data that we, have, we are getting from China uh, and the data from Hong Kong. So uh, apart from these two, uh, the ones in New York, uh, the, 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 the data that we are getting from uh, New York, they're all advocating for the use of remdesivir. And it's kind of like made as a uh, standard of therapy across the United States of America um, for about at least uh, one month and more than that, actually. Uh, before one month, it was used in certain parts of the United States and it was not really like made a standard of care. But now uh, remdesivir has been uh, pro given the status of, of uh, um, standard of care and has been brought into uh, practice changing uh, guidelines. First thing. Second thing with regards to hydroxychloroquine. Yes, there's been a lot of controversy with uh, hydroxychloroquine as well. There was one large study which showed that hydroxychloroquine is actually beneficial it was in Henry Ford Hospital here in Michigan. It was by far it, it recruited the largest group of population. Now, I'll tell you what, uh, the, the way it was perceived that hydroxychloroquine is beneficial is that patients were not substratified and it was given to all patients. Like, see, if there's a COVID-19 patient who is uh, asymptomatic, he was given hydroxychloroquine. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, hydroxychloroquine was also given to a pa patient who was really very severe in illness. Now, when we collected the pooled data, we really did not really stratify who is it really a beneficial to hydroxychloroquine. Is it really beneficial to severely ill patients, moderately severe uh, patients requiring oxygen therapy or no oxygen therapy, um, and then uh, which age group? So several articles that published uh, that uh, hydroxychloroquine is beneficial did not stratify. I can send you the article link as well. I was going over uh, this article about one week ago. Uh, it was done in Henry Ford Hospital here in Michigan. I've been to that hospital. I got an interview there. It's a phenomenal hospital, fantastic. But yeah, uh, I wouldn't attribute this one to any mystery or anything. It's just that we are all in need of a magic drug that can work for, pa uh, for patients with COVID-19. So we're trying to extract uh, data and trying to publish stuff that uh, might be beneficial out there. But then again, they're, uh, in contrast to this biggest study with about 5,048 patients, I remember properly, uh, there have been other several small studies which none of them have really shown at least um, statistically significant uh, data. But clinically significant, yes, as a clinician, if you're out there with your patients and your patients with hydroxychloroquine are getting better, I'm more than happy for that. I'm more than happy for that. Another thing, Dr. Rashid, ivermectin. Yes. Ivermectin appears to be a wonderful drug, according to the what I understood, according to my It can not only antiviral activity, it can prevent even the micro and macro thrombus formation. It is a nice Absolutely. explanation is there about ivermectin. It has right. wonderful uh, not uh, antiviral means anti coronavirus effect and also it can uh, prevent the micro and macro thrombus formation. So in that way, yes. And some studies in especially Bangladesh and even some of the one study in uh, uh, in Canada, of course, it is not reported one. Uh, 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 this one, no? mm, the elderly people. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, some, of course, the, the, that study uh, the says it is clearly very effective within three or four days, they are becoming negative after the ivermectin tre uh, treatment and no right. complications were developed. Yes, uh, again, once again, a wonderful question. Uh, really, I applaud you for this question. Um, so, uh, 
uh, I would touch base more on ivermectin and how it's really beneficial because uh, there's a lot to do because uh, there's been uh, new data that um, patients with COVID-19 are also having micro and macrovascular complications. Uh, there's some element of vasculitis underlying and then there's a increased propensity towards thromboembolism in patients in a lot of patients dying with stroke and other complications. You're true. You're, you're right about it. I would just touch base more on um, uh, ivermectin and, again, um, favipiravir as well. Uh, but uh, in, the, um, in, the, in, in the time constraint that we have, I did not want to extend it further because we do not have substantial evidence uh, to like, advocate it to the common public. But, yeah, that is, uh, that is going to be a wonder drug in the coming future, hopefully. Well, fingers crossed yeah. for, for Favipir so about, about and uh, Ivermectin both. Yeah. So what about this drug, uh, Dr. Rashik, Avictadil? Vasoactive intestinal peptide, FDA has given approval to use in complicated cases. Because Say it again, sir. Uh, I, I, I was not able to. Vasoactive, vasoactive uh, intestinal polypeptide, VIP analog, aviptadil. Okay. aviptadil. Okay. I'm not aware of this drug, sir. No, I'm not aware of this drug. I'll definitely go back and read about this, and uh, hopefully I'll, I can get back to you with a with with an answer to this. Oh, okay, thank you, Doctor Rashik, for a night. Uh, it was wonderful, wonderful meeting you, Doctor. <laughs> thank you so much. It was wonderful meeting you as well. Thank you so much for enlightening us all with some of the points that I may have missed. It was really wonderful talking to you. Yeah. Any further questions? What I feel still, we, everyone can try the ivermectin or. Uh, Chloroquine instead of going for the remdesivir, but personally I feel uh, this uh, company remdesivir the company systematically downgraded these drugs because if they uh, they prove these drugs are effective, their sales will come down. Okay. That may be their intention. The, by utilizing some fraudulent scientists, they downgraded these two drugs and they're projecting the remdesivir. So they made already but three three billion US dollars. But to be honest with you, to be honest with you, sir, uh, the, at least the patients that we see here, we've had phenomenal results with remdesivir. I can only hardly imagine anybody on remdesivir further progressing and requiring an ICU admission. Because we've had at least about uh, the latest census in our hospital so far, uh, we have about 1,267 odd patients uh, in inpatient hospitalizations. And um, I, I do not know an exact number of how many people got remdesivir, but um, I can only hardly imagine if there was anybody on remdesivir who needed ICU or intubation. They all really got better, and uh, uh, I don't see any reason why remdesivir should be stopped. But again, um, we need further trials. These are our preliminary reports, like you said. Uh, we do not have conclusive evidence for the use of remdesivir or uh, in that case, dexamethasone, or uh, in that case, any other drug. So we need more trials and conclusive evidence for proving these drugs should be beneficial. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Nice thank meeting you, sir. Okay. Yeah, any queries? Any questions? Or... Hello. 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 Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Ah, hello, sir. Sir, sir. Good morning, sir. Doctor Rasik, sir. Yes. It was an excellent presentation. I am Dr. Devika from uh, Community Medicine, sir, our uh, Dr. Kadravali, sir, colleague. So it was very excellent presentation. I want to do the compliment. And my question is very simple, sir, that why the case fatality rate is so high in your United States of America compared to other countries like India? Is there any specific reason for that case fatality rate, sir? So high it is in uh, American countries and all. Is there any specific reason, sir? Again, an excellent question. Thank you so much for bringing up this uh, topic, uh, Dr. Dr. Devika. Thank you so much. I really Thank appreciate you. your compliments. Uh, I take it with a grain of salt, and I still want to work more harder to present myself better. Um, coming back to your question of uh, uh, case fatality rate being very high in the United States, uh, so the potent they have there there are a lot of reasons for this, but uh, the most uh, thought over and the most propagated reason as to why there's a lot of case fatality rate in the United States by far has been among among people uh, within the communities and societies is that we have a larger section of population which is much older 
with a lot of uh, underlying comorbid conditions. It's not surprising to tell, tell you that patients here, uh, especially above 65 years, have uh, an atrial fibrillation epidemic. So every other patient that you see here, they have a lot of atrial fibrillation. We're trying to figure out as to why they have that. I'm just talking about one comorbid conditions. But on the other hand, um, we have uh, veterans who've gone to World War II and um, because of those baby boomers that have been um, occupying a significant proportion of the population, we have a large section of older population, the average lifespan of an average citizen of the United States of America being 87 years old. I've seen patients as old as 108 years old. So um, one of the reasons I would attribute towards this high case mortality rate is because of a lot of underlying comorbid conditions in especially the older population. The second reason I would say is because um, the Black, I would. I mean, I. I want to be open here. Uh, I don't. I don't want to have any barriers towards any political conversations. But uh, it's true, and it's it's out there that we did not really have any social distancing measures or any lockdowns as early as it could have possibly been. So that potentially, what could have been like a grain now has become an become become a rock. So th that's the saying goes, uh, if we would have uh, probably held the lockdown positions much earlier, uh, strict uh, measures um, with regards to immunity transmission would have been earlier. Maybe, maybe we could have done much better, but um, owing to the older age and um, the lack of proper um, social distancing measures and early lockdowns, I would attribute those two reasons as primary. There are definitely uh, dif different other reasons, though. Did, sir, did I, I want answer? to add, uh, yes, sir, okay. I want to add, it is my opinion that uh, mutation might have taken place by the time it reached to the India. So actually, we got the COVID from the Iran and Iraq primarily. So some mutation might have taken the virulence might have decreased by the time it reached to the India. That is one my my imagination, sir. And second thing, as the Indians, we are most of the time we are exposed to the so many diseases. So we have developed the immunity already. I think so, sir. This could be the yeah. some some contribution, sir. This is from my side. I'm thinking in this way. As you told, the old age population, lockdown, government, those things are also there. But virulence ha might have come, uh, it has reduced, I think, so sir, by the time it reached to the India. And as you know, the Indians, we are exposed to the like, N number of diseases. Sir. So we are developed for the immunity, I think. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Possible. Sir. No, Thank you, Thank you so much. It was really sir. nice meeting you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank My you so much. Here. So kind of you. Thank My you, opinion here now the disease is somewhat, it is under, uh, we under, uh, better under, uh, understood now. And also the steroids, earlier days they used to say steroids are absolutely contraindicated. They never used to try in ventilated patients. Are, uh, uh, so now we are using in that way, maybe uh, appropriate use of steroids, maybe preventing this uh, death rate or mortality rate in, uh, I believe. Could be. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasi. Any further questions or? Well, we move to next session. So, uh, Dr. Rasi, come on. I think now the time in Chicago is uh, 1 a.m. things from midnight. Uh, so, you have taken a lot yes. of efforts uh, and uh, you have discussed so many things clinical improvement with the remdesivir and the low dose dexamethasone, uh, mortality benefits, uh, and the role of uh, plasma therapy. And uh, so many things you have discussed very well. and. Uh, what a wonderful answers that you have given to our professors. Thank you so much, Dr. Rasikaman, once again. I'm proud of you. It's always a pleasure meeting you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. Thanks to all the students, the faculty, and everybody else who, who have uh, made this possible. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would want to take leave now because I have uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. all so, sir, excuse uh, me, sir. very early. Yes. Yeah, one, one question. Um, yes, sir, please. Sir, uh, this is Ashwardhan, sir. I am a student of Apollo Medical College. Yes, please. Uh, it was a really a great pleasure uh, you coming forward at this time and uh, telling about the pandemic, sir. 
Uh, we are very glad that uh, you are here and uh, you discuss the things with uh, our faculty and uh, our sirs and professors and uh, it's a uh, very thankful to you we are very thankful to you sir thank you thank you harsha thank you so much uh, that was so sweet of you uh, anything anything for for our people and really uh, it was a uh, really like very great sir uh, appreciate it appreciate it uh, harsha thank you so much and i thank wish you all the very best Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Rasik, we are moving to next session. Already the time is uh, becoming 12 p.m. now. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank next. you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, next uh, session. Yeah. Adhiti, madam. Over to Adhiti, madam. Thank you, Dr. Rasik. That was a very elaborative and very much needed session for us. Now, moving on to the next session, the next topic for the, today's CME is Management and Guidance of COVID-19 in Indian Scenario by Dr. Suresh Kumar. Let me introduce you to the speaker. Dr. Sur Suresh Kumar Chedlopalli is consultant terminologist at District Covid Hospital, Kadapa, Andhra Pradesh. He is also working as Associate Professor at Fatima Institute of Medical Sciences, Kadapa.